Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Friday, September 2nd, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, Hillary Clinton threatens war with Russia. The United States will treat cyber attacks just like any other attack. We will be ready with serious political, economic, and military responses. Meanwhile, under questioning by the FBI, Hillary says she can't remember getting briefed on how to secure government records. Because, get this, she had suffered from a concussion. Yes, she really said that. Plus, Donald Trump wants to build the wall higher and says it would be sweet justice to pay for it with money seized from the Mexican drug cartels. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. The FBI has gifted Hillary Clinton with yet another get-out-of-jail-free card, this time by way of a massive data dump on the Friday of a long Labor Day weekend. Ladies and gentlemen, today the FBI has released the report, a two-part, 58-page report of their investigation into Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server during her time as a Secretary of State. Now, there isn't really any notorious activity detailed in this report, but it does report on her encounters with the FBI during the investigation, and it also very clearly reports how her staff and herself either were completely incompetent or had a complete disregard for the laws and rules in accordance to the use of an email server and classified information. Now this full report can be found on FBI.gov. It's a two-part report, 58 pages, and you can go look at this report. There's a lot to be read. It will show you some of the nature of this Hillary Clinton cover-up, but you will also see a lot of this report is redacted, including names that have been redacted from this report. But you can find the full report on FBI.gov. So we know that more than 17,000 emails were recovered. Uh, we know that her server was breached even a month before she left uh, office there as Secretary of State. Um, she did indeed click on a porn phishing scandal. There was a, a phishing scam, and she actually, it appears that she... Uh, clicked on it, but she also repeatedly said, said that she could not recall. She said this so many times throughout the FBI report. I could not recall. I do not recall. Here are just some of the things. She couldn't recall her training that she received on get this classified information. She didn't recall using her power to classify. She didn't recall receiving emails that should not be on her unclassified system. And she did not recall briefings she received when leaving office. And why not? She could not recall because of her fall. All of these things were due to that concussion. Um, and this was what she told the FBI. She did not recall all these briefings uh, that because of this concussion that she suffered in 2012. And she went on further to say she received no instructions or direction regarding the preservation or production of records from the State Department during the transition out of her role as Secretary of State. Um, however, in December 2012, Clinton suffered a concussion and then around the new year had a blood clot in her head based on her doctor's advice. She could only work at state for a few hours a day and could not recall every briefing that she received. Uh, but you know what? Nothing to worry about here. Having a massive brain injury isn't going to impair her ability to do her job, right? At least that's what the establishment is really trying to make everyone understand. She also went on to tell the FBI that she didn't understand classified intel. So this is what she suggested to FBI investigators in this interview that she had in July. She had little understanding of classified information when she served as Secretary of State. Are you kidding me? She told FBI agents she couldn't remember ever receiving this training, how to preserve the federal records, or how to treat classified material, even though we now know that she signed off on completing the training. So she did indeed take it, but, you know, she had her little head injury. She, she just couldn't remember a lot of the most important things about her jobs. So here she's sort of setting it up that, you know, due to this injury, she's not guilty. You know, that's where the FBI said that they couldn't prove any intent to do harm. Now, she could not give an example of how classification of a document was determined. Now, of course, this is, you know, not do where she's telling her aides to just strip the classified markings 
from these materials so that she could send them on her unsecured server. Uh, what's more, Clinton said in an email that was central to this investigation. This one of these emails involved conversations about a planned drone strike in Pakistan. This didn't raise any red flags for her when she was transmitting this highly classified information over her unsecured server. Clinton stated deliberation over a future drone strike did not give her cause for concern regarding classification. Are you kidding me? That would be of the utmost classification level. Here you are um, not only undermining military efforts, but possibly putting people's uh, lives in danger if indeed your computer is hacked, which we now know, thanks to these recovered emails, she did indeed believe that her server was hacked, and we know that it had been as well. Um, also, Hillary Clinton lost cell phones with classified emails. Now, this is uh, Breitbart News reporting that she lost several mobile telephones carrying emails from her private server during her time in office. Uh, Huma Abedin and another former aide indicated the whereabouts of Clinton's devices would frequently become unknown once she transitioned to a new device. On other occasions, a staffer would destroy Clinton's old mobile phones by breaking them in half or hitting them with a hammer. And this is all very important because when you're destroying phones, that obviously indicates that you are well aware that there is sensitive information contained on these devices. So just to remind everyone, federal law prohibits the unauthorized transfer, storage, or destruction of classified information. Federal Records Acts likewise prohibit the destruction of government documents which would have included work-related emails on Clinton's server and mobile devices. So here, indeed, she did break federal law, but for whatever reason, James Comey just wanted to give her a little slap on the wrist and say that they were very, very reckless. And this is a person that we want to, well, not I, but they would like to see in the most powerful position in the United States. If Donald Trump threatened to go to war with a major military power, do you think the media would be interested? Yet Hillary Clinton just did precisely that. And it's barely a footnote in the mainstream press. Take a look. You've seen reports. Russia's hacked into a lot of things. China's hacked into a lot of things. Russia even hacked into the Democratic National Committee. Maybe even some state election systems. So we've got to step up our game, make sure we are well defended and able to take the fight to those who go after us. As president, I will make it clear that the United States will treat cyber attacks just like any other attack. We will be ready with serious political, economic and military responses. In case you missed that, Hillary just said that the next time Russia is blamed for a hack, because there's no evidence whatsoever that they were behind the DNC hack, Hillary will fight them with a military response. Fighting with a military response. That sounds a heck of a lot like a threat of war to me. Threatening to declare war on Russia. You'd think that would be a big story, right? Yet virtually no big media outlet even highlighted it. Donald Trump has been savaged for being reckless with his words, yet here we have Hillary openly invoking military conflict with a global superpower and the media gives her a free pass. We've had a year of hysteria over Trump starting World War III and having control over the nuclear codes. But it's not Trump who's brazenly threatening another nuclear armed country with war. It's Hillary Clinton. Clinton is crazy. She thinks Vladimir Putin is behind literally everything, from WikiLeaks email hacks to Trump to the rise of the alt-right, with zero evidence. But the media parrots it like it's gospel. She's also perfectly prepared to launch into wars that have disastrous consequences. We came. We saw, he died. <laughs> and I want the Iranians to know that if I'm the president, we will attack Iran. We would be able to totally obliterate them. Hillary Clinton openly threatening war with Russia. And the media doesn't even report on it. But they'll continue to lecture us about how it's Trump who's being irresponsible with his rhetoric. Give me a break. Well, here's something else that Hillary Clinton couldn't recall. 
She also wanted to build a wall. That's right. She mimicked Donald Trump here. She foreshadowed what Donald Trump was calling for, uh, saying, let's build a wall and deport illegal immigrants. There isn't any um, sensible approach except to do what we need to do simultaneously, you know, secure our borders with technology, personnel, uh, physical barriers, if necessary, in some places, and we need to have tougher employer sanctions, and we need to try to incentivize Mexico to do more, and we need to create the environment in which we get people out of the shadows and then give them some uh, earned right to legalization. So doesn't that sound an awful lot like Donald Trump's speech that he gave uh, in Mexico City on Tuesday? Of course, Hillary Clinton heavily criticized Donald Trump and, of course, just reiterated the fact that there's no way Mexico is going to pay for a wall. They'll never they'll never stand for it. Well, here's a here's something interesting. Uh, just how would Mexico pay for this wall? Donald Trump is actually toying with the idea of using seized drug cartel money to pay for the border wall. Trump came to Austin last week to solidify his stance on illegal immigration. He then flew to Mexico, where he did a two-man conference with Mexican President Peña Nieto, which was heralded as a great success across the hemisphere. Now, one major issue for Trump throughout his candidacy is securing the U.S.-Mexico border. Possibly using seized drug money to do this would be one way in which this wall is built. Now, something called a joint border security fund would be created by both Mexico and the U.S. depositing money that they've seized, law enforcement has seized from drug cartels and money from the illicit drug trade alone last year topped 8.7 billion. One study says that these cartels are making as much as 30 billion a year doing these illegal drug runs and Trump says that he could get this wall built for 8 to 10 billion. So it looks like he's going to be taking seized drug money from these cartels, putting it in a joint account that they've seized and using it to build this wall. Well, following a lot of outcry over its decision to uh, demonetize videos with controversial content. YouTube, the way they responded was by doubling down, saying, sorry guys, whatever, we've been punishing people for years. So this is obviously a Google-owned platform. They recently released new advertiser-friendly guidelines that stipulate how discussion of controversial or sensitive subjects and events would be punished by the user being unable to collect advertising money on such videos. So this prompted huge backlash from the YouTube community. Many people saw it as a way to de, uh, de-incentivize the creating of any videos that touch on contentious political or social issues, of course. Um, but YouTube just insisted that they had already been punishing controversial opinions for years. They say we haven't changed its policy on which videos will have adverts attached to them. Since 2013, we've just merely improved the way it communicates with its users. So they recently improved the notification and appeals process. But that doesn't really explain why they have just demonetized many videos willy-nilly. We've had hundreds of our videos demonetized as well. A lot of YouTubers saw videos on subjects like depression and acne being demonetized. Very controversial there. Uh, videos on freedom of the press, of course, are a little too controversial. But big giant corporations like CNN, uh, Sony Music Entertainment, and Universal Music Group, they can still put up their images of a Syrian boy covered in his own blood, or of course the sexually suggestive content that is coming out of a lot of these music videos. So they've obviously adopted a clear stance on who they're going to punish. This is exactly what Matt Drudge warned about when he appeared on the Alex Jones Show nearly a year ago. Creators allowing their content to be swallowed up by social media ghettos was always going to lead to this outcome. Donna Brazil, interment resident witch in chief, head of the DNC, uh, taking Debbie Wasserman Schultz's place after that massive corruption scandal gone bad. She made some pretty explosive statements on CNN this week. Too good to pass up. She says that Hillary Clinton was perfectly fine, nothing criminal about her pay to play activity as State Department head. Take a listen to this. The way I, I look at it, I, I've been a government official. So, you know, this notion that somehow or another, someone who is a supporter, someone who's a donor, somebody who's an activist saying, I want access, I want to I want to come into a room and I want to meet people. I, I, we, we, we often criminalize behavior that is normal. And it, I don't I don't see what the what the smoke is now. 
Brazil replaced one corrupt figurehead that now works for Hillary Clinton, and she seems to think that as a fellow politician, there is nothing wrong with paying for access to political officials. That's exactly what she said. It's normal. We all do it. Now, keep in mind, if there's any doubt that our system isn't corrupt, that it's non-transparent, take a listen to what the State Department official had to say, a wisecrack, if you will, when a reporter asked him about transparency in the State Department. To see you in this... Uh Exercise and transparency and democracy. <laughs> is that what it is? Now, if that hasn't made you sick already, those two, this is really reminiscent of what Obama said when he was questioned about, is our election system rigged? Take a listen. Uh, I, I don't even really know where to start on answering this question. Uh, of course the elections will not be rigged. What does that mean? <laughs> the federal government doesn't run the election process. States and cities and communities all across the country, they're the ones who set up the voting systems and the voting booths. And uh, if Mr. Trump is suggesting that there is a conspiracy theory that is uh, being propagated uh, across the country, including in places like Texas, uh, uh, where typically it's not Democrats who are in charge of uh, voting booths. Um, that's ridiculous. That doesn't make any sense. And I don't think anybody would take that seriously. Now, you think that's corrupt. Just wait until we get the dump of Hillary Clinton's emails. Those 15,000, the feds are reviewing them now. They're slated to be seen sometime around mid-October. And what they reveal next, who knows? But what we do know is our president is already on, making sure that she's got this election in the bag. He says that he's sending U.N. monitors to monitor our U.S. election because we just can't trust ourselves with it. But hey, all well and good. Right, Donna Brazil? I'm Margaret Howe reporting for Infowars.com. In just under 30 years, China has catapulted into a superpower, challenging American dominance in just about every field imaginable. But the real question is, is just how will China overtake the U.S. to become the supreme global power? There's a new film called China on Top, how China is using America's playbook to take over the world. It's a documentary film directed by Jonathan Roth, and it explores how China will become the world's economic and geopolitical leader. Let's go ahead and take a look at a scene from the film. My wife and I sponsored a gala to raise $2 million for the Asian Art Museums here on the Washington Wall. Part of that was an event involving Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State giving a large cash award and a medal to a Chinese artist. Art is a tool of diplomacy. It is one that reaches beyond governments, past all of the official conference rooms and the presidential palaces to connect with people all over the world. The artist blew up a Christmas tree, a very large Christmas tree, on the National Mall while we all applauded. I thought it was quite impressive, but I had doubts. Bye. Why are we paying this money to blow up a Christmas tree a few weeks before Christmas? So I asked the defector from China, who is this artist? How well known is he back in China? And the defector brought up some amazing material that this artist is particularly nationalistic. His favorite book is a book about how to use cyber warfare to bring Wall Street to its knees. This artist we had paid so much and made a star ourselves turned out to be quite nationalistic in his attitudes toward America. Look how far things have gone. We pay to have our own symbols destroyed.
And joining me now is award-winning Canadian television producer Jonathan Roth. Uh, your work has been featured um, Omni Television, Biography Channel, the Discovery Channel, and of course you're the executive producer at Roth Multimedia. And if people want to go ahead and watch this film, they just need to go to caseyresearch.com slash China, and they can find your work there. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. Now, we just watched a scene from your film uh, where basically I was kind of flabbergasted. Here we are um, actively destroying our own symbols and then calling it art, being mocked. Yeah, you know what, that, that clip, uh, basically when Michael Pillsbury, who's the gentleman who's in the clip, the former Under Secretary of Defense, uh, and has been the Pentagon's top China expert for uh, decades, really, uh, he, he told me that story. Um, and when I went to go look for the footage, actually, of, the, of this Christmas tree, because I figured someone must have shot this, given the, the size of the, uh, the event that Mr. Pillsbury described. And so long story short, uh, the Smithsonian was the one that shot the event. And they have footage of this Christmas tree exploding all over the Internet. And I secured the footage from YouTube, brought it into the documentary, uh, was cutting it. And then I approached the Smithsonian looking to you know, pay for the rights to use it. So long story short, after many much of a back and forth that I instantly realized that, that they were that they were putting up walls, finally they agreed to allow me to license the footage. And that was on a Monday. And by Friday, I, I hadn't heard anything and I had called them and said, look, I, I want to send you the check. We've agreed to how much this is going to cost. Let's just get it done. I get a call from the director of permissions from the Smithsonian. And he said, look, um, we've looked over everything. And unfortunately, I, I don't really think that your film fits into the categories that, that we would um, like it to in terms of allowing you to use this footage. Mm. Uh, you're gonna, going to actually have to approach the artist himself to license, license it. So I continue to ask him, look, who actually shot this footage? The people on the, uh, in the credits of the video clip, I went and I searched each of them to, to see what their background is. They all work for the Smithsonian, and yet you want me to go to this Chinese artist to license the footage. Uh, and he said, unfortunately, that that is what you're going to have to do. And ultimately, he actually agreed with me that I did fit the categories to allow, you know, the production to use the, the clips, but that they were just uncomfortable with me using it. So that, that was the first element that I thought was rather odd. Here's a you know U.S. government body blocking me from using this footage. Uh, and of course, the Associated Press has it, so I licensed it from them. But this, the second part of the story, which I find incredibly fascinating, is, is that Thursday of this week, uh, basically, I was, I was forwarded this by a, a close colleague, friend of mine, who said that uh, CNN on their Facebook page had just posted uh, essentially a puffed piece uh, article about this Chinese artist, that the article was actually written back in April, and it's like they recycled it and pushed it out there again, which I thought, you know, I, I've been in the news business myself for many years. There, there are really no coincidences, and I just thought that's rather odd that an article about him would come out the same week that, a, a, you know, a clip from my film that essentially shows them mocking the United States and any symbols that are, you know, American in origin. Um, right, especially <laughs> there with Hillary Clinton praising it and everything. So they've, of course, needed to challenge uh, the vision that you put out there about this art project. I mean, he's a great guy, so don't challenge that. I mean, Adolf Hitler made the cover of Time magazine. He was their man of the year at one point. So talk to me a little bit about uh, this, this secret plan that um, you exposed. China's carefully studied the U.S. and their rise to become a global superpower. How are they working to undermine the U.S.? Sure. Well, you know what? I think the, the best way to describe it is, is that uh, Michael Pillsbury, the gentleman I just referred to, Under Secretary of Defense of the United States, the Pentagon's top China expert for decades, uh, wrote a very a stunningly good book called The Hundred Year Marathon. Uh, it came out, I guess, maybe a couple of years ago, two, three years ago. And in that, he was he was really the guy that for the longest time, he actually was very supportive of U.S. efforts to try to engage China. Uh, and he was actually, I could tell you all kinds of stories as to how that relates to it, but essentially he began to change his mind uh, and eventually came to the conclusion that no, there were actually, if you date back to 1949, the year that, that, uh, that Mao took over and really you know, was able to get a firm grasp on China, that really uh, that is when China began to concoct this plan that they were essentially ultimately going to be, become the number one power in the world. Uh, and he goes into, he shows a lot of secret documents and such that were in his book that he exposed uh, the progression that China has made towards trying to attain this. Now, really, the documentary film, what I've tried to do 
is tell the story of how you, the U.S. rose to the top. Basically, in 1945, the British Empire was exhausted, and uh, and essentially the U.S. knew that this was going to happen. They'd been lending them a lot of money to fight the war. Uh, and at the end of World War II, essentially set up this meeting, Bretton Woods, and through that and through some other uh, mechanisms, really took control of the world and has pointed the world in, a, in a, an American direction for a long time. Uh, but the Cold War stepped in, and that really changed the focus of these institutions that were set up under Bretton Woods, things like the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, or the IMF, uh, and the world's you know, unrivaled reserve currency, the U.S. dollar. And uh, essentially, those vehicles were used to support U.S. efforts uh, to maintain uh, hegemony over top of the Soviet Union and uh, and point the world in, in a shape the world really in their image. And uh, and I think you can make a really cogent argument. That's exactly what they did. Um, but in the film, I, we interview a, a gentleman by the name of John Perkins, who's the author of a, of a book. Maybe some of your viewers might be familiar with Confessions of an Economic Hitman. And John tells the story of the president of Ecuador that he himself was personally involved with uh, in terms of trying to get uh, this president, his name was Jaime Roldos, to accept U.S. loans from the World Bank and essentially to corrupt this this uh, this president to allow more U.S. influence in Ecuador. And ultimately, the, the president did not want to do this, and he was he was killed. And it's uh, Perkins' contention, and I mean, he was there, he met with the president, is his contention that he was assassinated by the United States. And what I would argue is, is that I think uh, it's from the facts that I looked into, I'd say that's probably the, the case. Uh, but I think maybe more to the point, I think that there are two elements that really point to the fact that, that there's no question that this is probably what happened, is, is that to this day, Ecuador itself believes this. And that is why Julian Assange is sitting in the uh, Ecuadorian embassy in London and why Ecuador offered uh, Edward Snowden asylum after he initially uh, released all those documents and, and fled Hong Kong. Tune into the InfoWars Nightly News Monday for part two of our interview with Jonathan Roth. This is Ashley Beckford reporting for InfoWars.com. And I'm here to tell you how the federal government is actually grabbing guns from law-abiding citizens. I have an article here from the Associated Press. U.S. court upholds ban on gun sales to marijuana cardholders. A federal ban on the sale of guns to medical marijuana cardholders does not violate the Second Amendment, according to a federal appeal court. This ruling was by the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, and it applies to the nine western states that fall under the court's jurisdiction, which includes California, Washington, and Oregon, our medical and recreational cannabis states. Now, this lawsuit was filed by S. Rowan Wilson, a Nevada woman who tried to buy a firearm simply for self-defense in 2011 after she had already obtained a medical marijuana card. As we know, marijuana remains illegal under federal law. Even though Wilson is not a marijuana user, she obtained the card in an expression of support for marijuana legalization. But in this unanimous decision, these judges are assuming that mar medical marijuana card users are more likely to use the drug. They're saying that this use of cannabis raises your risk of irrational and unpredictable behavior with which a gun should not be associated. Wilson's attorney is saying he's going to appeal the decision and he's going to either present it to the same panel of judges that issued the original ruling, a larger panel of that same circuit, circuit court, or he's going to take it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And he's saying that even if you're on the no-fly list, your constitutional right is still protected. Wilson says that her gun rights were actually stripped without due process, and I would actually agree with her. The bottom line is this. The irrational and unpredictable behavior is actually coming straight from the federal government. We have a patent from the Department of Health and Human Services issued in 2003, patent number 6630507, cannabinoids as antioxidants and neuroprotectants. We have 
have the federal government who is actually saying blatantly, even though cannabis is a Schedule One drug that they're saying has no medical benefit, no medicinal benefit whatsoever, they're saying blatantly in this patent that they issued and was approved in 2003 that cannabis actually is a medicine. Although the people who are under this district court ruling that was just made are disproportionately going to be affected until the Supreme Court ruling or another ruling has been made, it really is affecting all Americans right now. This is just another way for the government to strip people's gun rights. We know that veterans can go into the VA and say that they're depressed or that they have PTSD and they're actually being stripped of their gun rights. Many veterans actually can use medical cannabis and there have been studies done to help them with the things that they've gone through through the fog of war. How can a federal government be legitimate when it actually criminalizes people who have served this country? How can a federal government be legitimate when it wants to throw out the Constitution, the founding documents of our country? The thing is this, I ask you to compare the number of people who have actually died from cannabis use versus people who have died from converting to Islam. When you put those two statistics next to each other, the juxtaposition is really shocking. The bottom line is this. No one's rights should be infringed. I agree with Tyson Beckford when he was talking about Matt Damon on TMZ and he said we should be 2A all day. I'm with him. This is Ashley Beckford reporting for Infowars.com. Stay tuned for more special reports. Hello, Neil. Who are you? I am the architect. I created the Matrix. Just how deep does the Matrix of the programming of the general public go? Would it surprise you to discover just how subtle and obvious the programming truly is? Back in 2011, Infowars spoke with Cuban-born journalist Alex Abeya about the RAND Corporation's infiltration of the American psyche. What RAND actually did during the 1950s is that they came up with this particular way of looking at the world that changed everything, that changed the world we live in, that, that changed how we think, how we talk, the schools we send our kids to, how we pay our taxes, the planes we fly in. They've changed the whole world. They developed something called rational choice theory that after it came up and after it was developed and expanded, it turned us from citizens into consumers. And instead of having rights and responsibilities, we became consumers with choices. In a world where what really counts is what they call the consumer sovereignty, or the sovereignty of the consumer, where what counts is not what we do, or who we believe in, or what God we pray to, but how much money we're going to spend, and what's in it for me. Choice. The problem. The rational choice theory has gradually been inundated in American culture for at the very least five generations. The matrix is older than you know. I prefer counting from the emergence of one integral anomaly to the emergence of the next, in which case this is the sixth version. The RAND Corporation is at the heart of the New World Order. It's part of that inner coterie, or almost a group of uh, ring wraith organizations that serve uh, this dark system. And uh, the RAND Corporation, literally, if you research the white papers they put out that are public, has set the policy that we are now living under in this country. And they have the uh, nerve to uh, you know, you know, locate themselves and get the street named 1776. Simply put, it's far easier to control a nation of mindless consumers than free-thinking individuals with strong beliefs. Globalist think tanks, 
The RAND Corporation, the CFR, hand-in-hand -hand with the CIA and the Pentagon, have developed and customized unyielding psyops on the American people, bringing us to the state of dysfunction we all experience today. After leaving the Washington Post in 1977, Carl Bernstein wrote for Rolling Stone, In 1953, Joseph Alsop, then one of America's leading syndicated columnists, went to the Philippines to cover an election. He did not go because he was asked to do so by his syndicate. He did not go because he was asked to do so by the newspapers that printed his column. He went at the request of the CIA. Alsop is one of more than 400 American journalists who in the past 25 years have secretly carried out assignments for the Central Intelligence Agency, according to documents on file at CIA headquarters. Fast forward to the present day, and those same meddling internal forces have grown a mutated psyop into monstrous proportions in the form of Black Lives Matter. The Washington Times recently revealed that the Ford Foundation and Borealis Philanthropy recently announced the formation of the Black Lead Movement Fund, BLMF, a six-year pool donor campaign aimed at raising $100 million for the Movement for Black Lives Coalition. That funding comes in addition to more than $33 million in grants to the Black Lives Matter movement from top Democratic Party donor George Soros through his Open Society Foundations, as well as grant making from the Center for American Progress. Well, yes, I mean, there's been always a link between think tanks and the big powerful economic interests. Specifically, in the case of RAND, there's been a link between RAND and the Ford Foundation. The Ford Foundation has been providing cover as a CIA funding arm since the Cold War, and Borealis Philanthropy has been expanding funding to bring in an invasion of illegal immigrants into the United States, raising over $90 million in eight years. America is being eaten away from the inside out, and it's getting easier and easier as more and more Americans isolate themselves from their fellow citizens and their inherited responsibility to be mindful of the overwhelming evidence that we are being smothered under a blanket of globalism. John Bound for Infowars.com. I'm Margaret Hell reporting for Infowars.com. You know, we've heard a lot about robots and how they're taking over human jobs and they're starting a very uneasy transition into society where they're very normalized. I'm joined in studio by Ashley Beckford. We're going to be talking about some of these cases, Ashley, that we put together. The first one that I want to mention, France, uh, it's rolled out the, the world's first driverless bus. So if you're comfortable getting on a city bus without actually having a driver, you might want to visit this French town. These driverless minibuses, they're going to be taking passengers in the eastern part of the French city of Lyon, if I'm saying that correctly, and I live there. Um, at the weekend time, it's going to be a year-long experiment, weekends only, two electric vehicles. Get this, though, they're, they're not going fast enough to kill anybody. They're only going to go 12 miles an hour. So unless, you know, it's, it, it'd be hard-pressed for one of these buses to actually kill someone. Uh, costing 225000 each. Would you get on a bus with no driver is my first question. Uh, well, absolutely not, Maggie. Uh, well, first of all, they are, I think, going to actually have drivers probably there within the seat, even though it says it's a driverless car. I think a lot of these new technologies, they're actually still having human drivers in the seat, but it's just the technology is going to be able to drive the vehicle. But even though you say it's only going 12 miles per hour, I'm concerned that in that 12 miles per hour, you can still really do mm -hmm. some damage, you right. know? I mean, so you would be, so these buses you're saying would have the driver, perhaps an, as a passenger, just kind of monitoring and making sure that everything's working. Here. Right. According to this article, so the, these many buses, they've been tested in French cities, including in, the, in uh, Switzerland, uh, not carrying any passengers, of course. But I don't know if you remember this case, uh, the Tesla manufacturer, this driver, car. We covered it here in InfoWars. The man was decapitated. He was watching Harry Potter behind the wheel of his of his driverless car. It goes underneath a tractor trailer and decapitates him. Right. So, but obviously not going 12 miles an hour. No, going much faster, but that's the problem with these driverless cars is that they're actually not safe. They're not actually giving us 
the ability to test these out in a proper fashion before you're really going out there and risking your life. This guy, they said, you know, he had he was going to be safe. Tesla said, you know, go ahead and get into this vehicle. But then he comes up to a technological issue with the vehicle where it's not even recognizing this tractor trailer and that's how the accident ended up happening. Right. Well, speaking of cars and other technology, you know, Ashley, you have a story for us regarding a Mercedes technological advancement. Yes, that's correct, Margaret. Actually, this story was linked on the Drudge Report today. The headline is Mercedes to transform cars into roving parking space finders. So automobiles are driving past free spots and they're going to be able to share this information via the cloud network. So Mercedes-Benz cars are going to give each other a heads up when a space is actually free. Uh, several car makers are doing this. They're saying it's going to reduce the time and stress needed to find parking, which is also a burden on cities because you know that adds to traffic congestion and pollutions from the vehicles making loops. And uh, they're hoping uh, over at Daimler AG that this is gonna help people save time. And in addition to that, they're actually going to be delivering parcels to your trunk directly. They have online shopping parcels that are going to deliver directly to your car's trunk following uh, next year. It's a broad pilot po project that they've already done uh, with smart city cars. And basically they have these sensors that are gonna be able to find these parking spots, <laughs> uh, even if you're going up to 35 miles per hour or 55 kilometers. They're gonna be sharing the information about the probability of finding a space, real-time info, the exact location and the size of spots which is gonna create a digital parking map that can be displayed in the car. And all the cars basically are already connected. So if they already have the sensors, you're set right now. So what do you think about that? Look, I'm fine with the, the cars not bumping into each other. The cars can talk to themselves <laughs> for, for all I care, as long as they don't start talking to me. And I know Bluetooth and Siri and things like that, they kind of talk to us, and they really humanize this type of technology and they're getting us ready for a takeover. Uh, you know, robots policing us. We're gonna be talking about that in just a second. I'm just going to go to that now. Security robots, they're already patrolling these parking lots and neighborhoods. Now, they're basically wow. glorified security cameras. There's a company called Nightscope. It's manufactured two of these bots, and they're in malls. Mm. It's a little security camera. It roams around. It tells you, like, not to spit your gum out, you know, things like that, where to put your trash. But they've started policing us, Ashley, and these wow. robots, they've really humanized them. So, Mm. They they record video, provide thermal imaging, they read license plates, they track parked cars, they serve as a two-way intercom. They play this pre-recorded message, so there's not really a lot of emotion with any of these. They're not human yet, if you will. They're big in scale, they're about 300 pounds. And mm -hmm. I'm fine with security cameras in malls. That's great. You've got one on wheels that kind of talks. It's annoying. You really wouldn't want some big bot following you around. I'd prefer not. Yeah, I will. Me too. So the mm -hmm. security cameras that are stabilized, it's one thing, but this is basically a security camera on wheels. Right. It's robotic. It has no emotion, uh, but it alerts uh, security to when you're doing something wrong. So mm, okay. um, cutting down on the human aspect of having these jobs putting these big bots in. Of course, some Silicon Valley entrepreneurs come up with this, a way to modernize and privatize um, and monetize the services that were once entrusted to law enforcement. This is taking that a step further. Now, speaking of, of robots, so mm -hmm. if you're not comfortable with this, you might not be comfortable with a robot uh, forming... I don't think I will be. <laughs> I know where you're going with this. Forming an emotional connection. So I hate housework myself. So when I originally read okay. this article, I'm like, I wouldn't... I'd be fine with a machine vacuuming the floor. That'd be fine with The me. Roomba? That will, this that is sort of a Roomba <laughs> with, with eyes and a, and a face that talks to you. Uh, this is something that Sony is building. Um, and they say that it can form an emotional connection with humans. So Disturbing. These para-human robots would be vacuuming your floor. And, you know, it, it, you'd, you'd be hard-pressed not to have an emotional connection to somebody who's serving you. So it's sort of humanizing uh, the, the bot. And uh, this artificial intelligence is becoming smarter than humans. That's the kind wow. of fear where we're going with this. This one just vacuums the floor. Mm -hmm. um, but we're getting to a place that's very, uh, that's a Will Smith movie, frankly. Well, yeah, and, or The uh, Matrix, uh, right. you know, 1984, where, mm -hmm. you know, the total awareness kind of model we're going to that area definitely mm -hmm. because 
people are actually so obsessed with technology mm -hmm. that they actually need to go to digital detox camps at this point. I have an article here from NBC Universal. People cope without tech at digital detox camp. 66% of us apparently suffer from nomophobia, which is a fear of losing your phone or not having access to your phone. This has actually led to a trend in digital detoxing. And they have these retreat, retreats where they're actually structuring time away from technology. More than 100 people came to a recent camp called Grounded in North Carolina for four days of tech-free play. And basically it has physical and psychological benefits because you know as the technology gets more and more pervasive in our lives, we really need a break sometimes. And one of those reasons you might need a break is because of this article. Are cell phones to blame for certain skin issues? Actually, cell phones are causing a lot of skin issues this, these days because people are carrying around these cell phones. They're extremely, extremely dirty. Uh, it's causing uh, skin issues uh, from the sweat, the makeup, anything you have on your hands, germs from any place you put your hands. Actually, one study found out cell phones are contaminated with more bacteria than the an toilet actual seat. toilet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is dirtier yes. than a toilet seat. And it's more dangerous than you might think. You know, people think about MRSA and they realize that that's a dangerous thing, but they're saying staff, uh, staph and strep infections, those bacteria are actually even more dangerous because they're so common, they're so prevalent. And that's actually what causes acne. Um, so another thing too with cell phones is that people are allergic to nickel so that can cause a cell phone rash and the bacteria <laughs> actually gets into your pores and follicles it can cause folliculitis it can be solved with topical treatments they say you know just clean your phone with an antibacterial wipe you know what do you think about that you know i it's it's really disgusting and if you uh, would like to know more about reports <laughs> just like this please join us on infowars.com you can hear the latest tech report with us and also take a look at these robots are we humanizing them are they becoming too much like us and oh by the way yeah you might want to put your phones down occasionally that's going to do it for us for tonight thank you so much for joining us uh, please join us on monday night for a special labor day report 7 p.m central the nightly news will be here we hope to see you. We hope that you enjoy your weekend and have a fantastic Labor Day.